Hi everyone, good afternoon and welcome to St. John's Riverside Hospital um, to this program, which is COVID-19 vaccine, what's the real deal? I am Denise Mananis. I am the uh, Senior Director for External Affairs for the hospital. And um, we wanted to do this program today because the vaccine has gotten quite a bit of uh, media attention and there's a lot of information and misinformation that's out there in the community. And so we wanted to help provide some clarity to this discussion. Um, but before we begin, I would like to thank my team, Candace Cousins Hopkins, Olivia Hunter and Nancy Anabi, as well as our IT team, Mike Matalal and Jason Latour for all of the hard work behind the scenes that they do to make this program possible. Um, and also I would like to thank our program partners, um, Sally Pinto, who is with the Yonkers NNORC, which is the Neighborhood Naturally Occurring Retirement Community. Uh, that is under the umbrella of the Yonkers Office for the Aging and Westchester Jewish Community Services. Uh, they provide programs and activities, services, including nurse and resource specialist uh, to senior 60 plus living in Northeast Yonkers. And Z Baird, who is from Yonkers Public Library um, that has three locations in Yonkers, the Riverfront, Will and Crestwood, um, so please visit their website for hours of service, programs, downloadable books, streaming movies, and more. And that website address is www.ypl.org. So uh, getting right to our program here, we would like to introduce um, our speaker, Dr. Rampersad, Dr. Rajendra Rampersad. He is the Chief of Medicine at St. John's Riverside Hospital. He is also the Director of our Intensive Care Unit um, and honestly an invaluable member of our medical leadership during uh, what has been a tremendously difficult year of uh, fighting COVID and um, we thought there was no one better to um, to talk about this today. So I'm going to uh, turn the program right over to Dr. Rampersad. Thank you all for being with us. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so like Denise said, I'm uh, Raj Rampersad. I'm the chief of medicine and the director of the ICU. And um, like everyone on this call, I'm sure has been aware uh, COVID has uh, definitely changed uh, us over the past year. So um, obviously we're all hoping for uh, a better new year to sort of start off. And I just wanted to go over a, a couple of things to, um, you know, give you a sense of, of what's been happening. So when you look at the number of world cases, the number of cases around the world is almost at a 100 million. Uh, when you look at the amount of people who have uh, died from COVID, um, it's over 2 million. Um, in the United States, um, you know, we're rapidly approaching 25 million the death toll um, is over 400,000, but as you can imagine, these numbers um, may not be representative of actually what's going on because you know people are dying of uh, in the community, they're dying in um, you know chronic care facilities, and not everyone is getting tested. Uh, in Westchester County, we're uh, almost over 89,000, and the number of deaths is probably close to 1,900. So with those numbers, it, it's something very staggering. And, you know, when you look at the, the rise of increase, and I'm sure everyone is seeing uh, in the newspapers and in social media and uh, different sources that there's a lot of variants of the coronavirus that they're finding all the time. Um, and we'll discuss that a little bit. But I just wanted to go over a couple of things about the immunization process. And uh, if you have any questions, you know, please, you can write them in or, you know, get them to, to the team. And uh, even though like uh, the COVID virus is not something to uh, make light of or to joke about, there was one little uh, meme that I saw um, that I found quite humorous. And, and right now with all of the things that are going on in the world and especially with COVID, uh, I find a little humor sometimes can uh, lighten the mood and try to, you know, rezone us back to a point where, you know, COVID, uh, nobody knew about it. So um, here's a little slide of uh, two little mice. And, you know, as many of you know, uh, the poor mice get the brunt of uh, medical experimentation. So uh, here's one little mouse saying, uh, are you going to get vaccinated? And the other one saying, are you crazy? They haven't finished the human trials yet. Um, and that is something true, and we will discuss that a little bit more in detail to sort of uh, allay people's concerns about the vaccine. So the first thing I like to do is to talk about what is a vaccine. And vaccinations have been around in history for a very long time, um, back to the 18th century. 
And I'm sure many of you have heard conditions like tuberculosis, yellow fever, and influenza. And in the 1980s, um, we actually eradicated smallpox. Um, and another condition that was basically eradicated by vaccination was polio. So polio is actually the advent of critical care, and this is how uh, mechanical ventilators came about. So down at John Hopkins University, people were in these big metal containers called iron lungs, and that's how uh, they used to breathe. And um, people who had polio without treatment, about 80% of them died, so eight out of 10 people. And unfortunately, that's a similar number with COVID. And after they started vaccinating people, that number basically came down to zero. So vaccines have been a very important part of our history. It's been a very important part of us treating disease process. So there's a couple of different types of vaccines. So there is a live attenuated vaccine. And as you can see, some of the examples are the MMR that you know, we get when we're growing up. Um, and basically what this is, it's a live um, organism that when you we use the word attenuated, what that means, it's sort of genetically changed that is not as virulent or as dangerous. And what happens is now when the patient gets inoculated, it creates a very robust antibody response. Um, there's also inactivated vaccines, and um, the most common one that we'll sort of know is the influenza vaccine. So this is a killed version of the organism. Um, it's important to uh, recognize that these vaccines cannot give you the disease process. And I know a lot of times people feel that after they've been vaccinated, they get a little bit of fever, they get a little bit of body aches, they may have some reaction, but that's actually your immune system telling you that I recognize something should not be here and I am going to uh, make a response for you to build antibody. So with these inactivated vaccines, you cannot actually catch the infection. Um, there's also vaccines that are a subunit um, a recombinant polysaccharide, and these are like the pneumococcal vaccines. So a lot of people call this the pneumonia vaccine, but it's really pneumococcus. Um, and they do not contain the organism. So again, you cannot catch the disease process from these type of vaccines. And another one is a toxoid, and a common one that most people would know is something like of tetanus. And this is also a part of the organism, and it's not the whole organism. So limitations. So while conventional vaccines are critical in controlling disease, there is limitation in terms of production of the vaccine, um, deployment of the vaccine, and we'll get to that a little bit because that's an important part of our COVID vaccination process. And also, we are relying on, instead of a innate response, meaning our own body, so sometimes this is something that is an adaptive response. And the problem with this is we can't determine with uh, certainty the amount of time that the patient will actually be immune uh, to this condition or have some type of immunity. So as uh, some of you know that the two vaccines right now that are being distributed is the one by Bio, uh, BioNTech and Pfizer, and the other one is Moderna. And these vaccines are actually uh, mRNA vaccines. And a lot of people were concerned because they felt that this was a brand new technology. Actually, the type of mRNA vaccines have been around for a while. They've actually made uh, influenza vaccines when the Zika virus was out. They were doing this to make Zika. What is true, though, is we've never had a scale of vaccination production of the mRNA. And again, from this type of vaccine, you cannot catch the disease process from these vaccines. So this is a very, very savvy type of way to introduce this to our bodies. Basically what happens is that a small piece of messenger RNA um, gets put into um, a vector. And then what happens is this gets sent into the body uh, through an injection. And our little building uh, machines of our cells are called ribosomes. The ribosomes now to start to make proteins. And when these proteins start to spill into the bloodstream, what happens is that our immune system now comes into uh, play. And just as a quick reminder how our body works. So just say we have a infection or an illness, there's a couple of things that happen. So one thing is that we have red blood cells and white blood cells. Our white blood cells, uh, there's a specific cell called the macrophage. And what this cell does is it sort of sees these little uh, substances in the body that shouldn't be there. And it tries to swallow them and chew them up to protect us. Once it processes these uh, pieces of material, it sends little antigens into the bloodstream. Then what happens is our B lymphocytes recognize that and they start to make antibodies. And then we also have T lymphocytes and one component of the T lymphocyte are memory cells. And this is what gives us some immunity. 
So basically what happens is that this mRNA uh, gives us basically like a recipe or like a code to tell the body that there is a certain thing called a spike protein. And when you look at pictures of the coronavirus, you'll see it has like this very characteristic sort of little knob on it. And that's how it actually gets the name because it looks like almost like a little crown. So that spike protein is what this MRSA, uh, mRNA um, is actually coding for, and our body actually makes the antibodies. So again, um, the Pfizer BioNTech and the Moderna vaccine use this type of technology. Um, one of the difficulties with this type of vaccine is that uh, the way that it's stored. And so again, it has to be stored at about negative 94 degrees Fahrenheit, and that poses some issues. One of the nice things with this type of vaccine is that it can actually be made very quickly and not as expensive as the other types of vaccinations. So this is why with all of these uh, companies and all of these resources out there trying to make vaccines to help uh, you know, save us from the coronavirus, the mRNA vaccines were the first ones to come out because they were the ones that were easiest produce and can be mass produced. So again, we talked a little bit about the history of this and here are just some uh, slides of uh, different types of viruses. So again, uh, the Zika virus, rabies, influenza, um, and actually HIV. So this type of um, vaccine therapy has actually been out for quite some time, but it has not been to the scale that we're seeing right now. Um, the two vaccines again is the Pfizer BioNTech, and here is the, uh, the name on it here. And again, what it does is it basically encodes for the spike protein on the SARS-2-CoV, um, and that's what gives it the very characteristic speed. Vectorized vaccines. So what this basically means is that what they're going to do is they're going to take another type of virus and they're actually going to encode the virus with a weakened form of the coronavirus. Um, and one of the things we'll discuss is the Johnson & Johnson, because I'm sure a lot of you has been seeing that this is the, the third vaccine that's hopefully going to be produced and gained uh, FDA approval. So in terms of the, the vectorized vaccines, uh, I'm sure some of you have seen um, you know, there's a common virus called the adenovirus. Um, there's some studies where they actually injected a chimpanzee, um, you know, to try to get uh, an immune response to see if that works, and it actually does. So basically what they do is, is they actually take an adenovirus, which is a very common virus that causes a mild um, viral illness, and they actually attach a piece of encoding onto the virus. So once it gets into the patient, what happens now is that the adenovirus will degrade and this little piece of information now will be picked up by our immune system. And again, it's almost like a recipe or a template and it will start to make um, antibodies against a certain antigen. Um, next slide. So this is just a little slide to show you the structure of the SARS-CoV. And again, if you look at the little green uh, little knobs on there, that's actually the spike protein. And that's where um, the vaccines are targeting. And again, it's a very characteristic thing. And on the variations of the coronavirus that you're seeing you know, in the media and on the news, the variations are actually coming into certain parts of the spike protein. Uh, so the natural history, uh, this is kind of a busy slide. And again, it's a little bit more maybe medical stuff than most people want to see. But the basic premise behind this is again, that we are uh, using our own body's uh, machinery and mechanism to actually produce uh, the antibodies that you'll have to protect yourself from the coronavirus. Uh, questions that I see get a lot or that you see in the media, does the vaccine alter the DNA? Now remember, so the MRSA, uh, it, it is not capable of altering DNA. When this little piece of information comes into us like a little coding device or a little recipe, it actually breaks down rather quickly. Now, when the body recognizes the genetic coding, what happens is, is now it takes that information, just the information, not part of the virus, not part of the wall, not part of the genes, and it does not put that into your own genetic code. Basically, all it's doing is just giving us a template to make antibodies. So again, the vaccines do not alter uh, your DNA. Um, again, they can't alter uh, your RNA as well, um, and it's not something that is amplifying. So basically what that means is that when it gets into your system, it's not going to multiply there, unlike other viruses. So all it does is it gives our body the little recipe, and then over the course of time, this cellular piece actually degrades by itself. 
Uh, this slide is again a little bit dizzy, and so just for those who are interested in the doses of it, so the Moderna vaccine and the, the Pfizer BioNTech is actually two doses. Um, the first dose of the Pfizer vaccine is followed by a 21 day booster and the uh, second dose of the Moderna is followed by a 28 day booster. Uh, recently, I'm sure some of you have seen that we have a new head of the CDC um, and there was some misinterpretation of what she was saying because some people were asking, well, if I get the first dose as Pfizer, can I actually get the Moderna vaccine? Um, it was misinterpreted what this person, what this doctor said, because some people think that you can actually get a combination of the two. What her actual statement was, and she clarified it yesterday, is that sometimes people forget either which vaccination they received or the exact date. So the window for actually getting the vaccine, she actually said it could be about four to six weeks. So just say that on day 21, that's a day you cannot get your Pfizer or day 28 your Moderna. Don't panic. Uh, there is a way for you to actually get the vaccine, the second shot safely. The other thing that was a concern is that if there was the poor documentation of the vaccine that you received, um, can you get the other vaccination from the other company? And the answer is yes, because these are extraneous circumstances. And what we do know is when you get the first vaccination, um, your immunity level or the effectiveness is not probably more than 50 or 60 percent. So in order to get you to those quotes of about 94 to 9, 95 percent for both vaccines, you do need that second booster shot. So when they talk about efficacy, there's two things. So efficacy is basically what they see in a controlled uh, clinical trial. You have to remember, we don't have a lot of real world experience with this. The first cases of COVID-19 were in China, in Wuhan in December of 2020. So if you can imagine, you know, we've had, uh, you know, just a little bit over, you know, 12 or 13 months to actually study this and to analyze it. Um, and I feel actually quite fortunate that we do have a vaccine now because a lot of times, sometimes it takes multiple years to get a vaccination. So when we talk about effectiveness, the effectiveness will now come into retrospective analysis of the people who've been vaccinated in, in the real world and to see how many of those patients actually did not contract the COVID virus. Uh, in terms of efficacy, uh, both Moderna and Pfizer are reporting about 95% efficacy with both vaccinations. Um, one thing also is for the immunity. So we actually don't know how long this will last. And you know, one of the things that is quite concerning is that uh, there is uh, good data that patients who have uh, had the COVID infection, they may lose their antibodies in about three or four months. So if you can imagine if your immune system now does not have antibodies to protect you, you can theoretically get reinfection. The good news is, is the reinfection rate has been quite low. Um, unfortunately, uh, there are cases that are well documented of patients who had COVID-19, they developed antibodies, they lost the antibodies, and they got reinfected with the COVID vaccine uh, virus again. So unfortunately, it is possible to get reinfected. Um, one of the things that we're seeing in the community as well, which is also a little bit worrisome, is that patients who have had COVID, or especially over the last couple of months, are actually not developing antibodies. And this is you know, something that um, you know, we're not sure about why this is happening, but obviously, um, you know, these patients are at, again, risk of developing COVID in the short term. So one of the big things again, and it sounds extremely simple, but when you uh, really break down and see um, what actually helps with prevention of COVID, it's just a couple of simple things. So masking is extremely important. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen that it's, uh, you know, now with President Biden in, um, you know, there's going to be a huge national effort again uh, for masking. Um, and again, uh, two people masking is better than just one person having a mask on and not the other one. Uh, hand washing. So about 20 seconds of good uh, hand washing with just regular soap and water. And if you are going to use something that has alcohol based, it has to be about 65, 60% uh, 60 alcohol based and social distancing. So um, the distance that we feel is appropriate is about six feet uh, from each other. And these three simple measures will actually greatly reduce um, your uh, ability to contract COVID from another person. So I know I ran through that uh, very quickly, um, you know, discussed a little bit about, you know, where we are um, with COVID in terms of where we were came from uh, with the vaccines, the different types of vaccines, how vaccines in general work. Uh, right now, unfortunately, we are in a um, increasing number of COVID cases. Um, you know, again, we're having uh, many people coming in with um, COVID infections. 
In the United States, unfortunately, we don't have the capacity yet, but this is something that the CDC would like to do, is to actually uh, do genome testing on the viruses. So when patients in Europe now um, have the infection, they have the ability to actually check the, the genetics behind it. And that's why when you see reports from, you know, from the UK, or you see it from certain parts of Asia, or in other places like Australia, they're actually telling you that we know we have variations in the um, coronavirus. Um, we hopefully will have that soon, so this way we can track to see. As of now, there's probably less than 800 cases of the South African strain, and fortunately there is no cases uh, as of yet that we know of in the United States. Um, I'm sure some of you have seen there's been uh, several variations in the Brazilian strain. Um, and again, so there are some sporadic cases here in the United States, but they're not very much. And the couple of questions that we uh, asked, but we don't know the full answers to, is are these uh, viruses more deadly? Meaning that when you have them, do they have the chance of uh, death more frequently? And that we don't know. Uh, we do know that the new viruses seem to be more infectious, meaning that you know if you um, are not socially distancing, you're not washing your hands, or you're not masking, it is easier for somebody to contract the virus um, with the new strains. So I think from here, what we'll do is, is uh, I'll exit out of here. So Dr. Ramprasad, I have a, a number of questions that I can I can ask sure. and then you can respond to. So the first one that I have is um, I have this is from someone in our audience. I have many seasonal and medicine allergies. What are the risks um, in getting the vaccine? So that's that's a good question. So I know a lot of people become uh, concerned that they have certain allergies. So the people who need to be concerned with vaccination are those who have a history of anaphylaxis. So there have been reports of uh, you know very few numbers. Now you have to remember we've probably um, rolled out over five million vaccines, and I'm sure that you know for you know hundreds of thousands of people are going to get vaccinated, but the one person who may have an allergic reaction, those are the ones that we sort of hear about. Um, no one has, to, to our knowledge, no one has died of the vaccine. Um, I know there were reports of a physician down in Florida who got a vaccine and uh, had uh, a hemorrhage in his brain um, about a week and a half later. So that was not linked back. So Pfizer has done some research on that. That type of um, side effect was not known. So unless you have a true history of anaphylaxis to a medication, um, you can actually get the vaccination. So people with seasonal allergies, people with allergic rhinitis, people with uh, penicillin allergies. So those things are actually okay. The only thing we need to be concerned about is if you have anaphylaxis. Now, if you do have anaphylaxis, uh, we can treat those things. And there have been, you know, sporadic reports of people getting the vaccine who have had uh, quote unquote severe allergic reaction. Uh, none of those patients died from the reaction. None of those patients required hospitalizations and they were all treated as an outpatient. And basically what that would entail is taking uh, steroid medications and taking some type of antihistamine medication. So yes, if you have seasonal allergies, you can get the COVID vaccine. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question, can you tell me a little bit more about what you know about reactions to the vaccine, especially the second shot in people with, um, my questions are going away, I don't know what's happening. Uh, <laughs> but the, the question is, um, has to do with the second shot and is it different between the Moderna or the, and the Pfizer shot? Okay, so with the second shot, so one of the things that we're noticing, and again, the recommendations from the CDC sort of vary. So if you have uh, risk factors and there's a sort of algorithm in terms of medical history and age, so above the age of 75 is considered high risk, then people uh, you know, above the age of 65 with medical problems, if you have kidney disease, diabetes, you have COPD, you have severe obstructive airways disease, you've had uh, cardiac disease, um, people who have uh, neuromuscular diseases. So all these people are considered high risk. So with those patients, we uh, really want everybody to get that second shot. So when you have the first um, injection, we really don't know what percentage of um, efficacy that it has. Some people report 50%, some people say 60%, some people say 80 To be honest, we have no um, evidence-based information of just what percentage that is. Now, in order to get you that 95%, you need to get that second booster. So what we've been sort of noticing in clinical practice is the patients who have had the COVID infection, 
um, they tend to have a little bit more of a robust response to the vaccine. Now, some people will think that's a bad thing, but that's actually a good thing. And the reason why is that, remember, we're giving you that little spike protein and your body is telling you, I remember that this protein and this antigen should not be inside of me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my immune system now to sort of go after that, that uh, virus. So it means that whatever antibodies you have inside of you is, is actually working. Most of the patients, by vast majority, will have about 24 to 48 hours of an illness similar to a viral infection. So you may get some myalgia. A lot of people will get a very minor discomfort at the site of the injection. Some people may have some fever. Um, but again, this is your body telling you that I recognize that something is coming inside of me that should not be here and I am doing something about it. Um, so I know sometimes people are concerned about that, but when you think of the, the grand scheme of things, having that additional one or two days of uh, myalgias and a little bit of fever greatly outweighs um, you know, any other thing that you would get from not taking the vaccination. Okay, um, this is one that I've heard quite a bit and has made a lot of people sort of be on the fence about getting the vaccine, which is can the vaccine cause infertility? Yeah, so, you know, this this is another good question. So I think this is, uh, and, and, and it has some scientific basis. So there's basically a protein that, you know, uh, is made by the human body that allows for the placenta to attach to the uterus. And that protein has a very similar structure to components of COVID-19. And one of the things is that was concerned was, is that, well, if now you're giving an injection to somebody and encoding a little piece of genetic material that fights or tells the body that uh, this protein is not good for us, then people can stand to reason that maybe that now the placenta is going to be attacked by the antibodies. So this is actually not true, and we have no evidence that this is true. Again, when you think about the, uh, the minuscule amount of genetic material that's actually being placed into the body, and it actually degrades itself. The other thing that we've seen is that if you um, anticipate that um, the antibodies even made if you have the infection naturally or by vaccination, everyone or for women who have childbearing age, if they've had the COVID infection, all of those antibodies would attack their placenta, which has not happened. So when you look at people who have natural immunity, you know, the, the natural immunity would actually attack the same structures. So we have no evidence that this is true. And, you know, one of the things is every um, medical specialty um, has their own societies. And one of the things that I like to do is to look at the different societies and see what they recommend. So, for example, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, when you look at their recommendations, they actually tell you that if you're somebody who uh, should be getting the vaccine, you should get the vaccine. So their recommendation as a specialty is to say pregnant women should get the vaccination if it's appropriate. Uh, women who are breastfeeding can get the vaccination if they feel it's appropriate. So this is, you know, a, a huge body of specialties who take care of women's health. They take care of babies. They take care of pregnancy. Um, and if they're sort of supporting this, then I think that should give us a lot of uh, comfort that, you know, somebody's actually looking out for, um, you know, the pregnant population. Um, now, one of the things that is true is that when you look at the people who were studied with the vaccination, there was not studied in pregnancy. The Moderna vaccine was actually studied in some pregnant lab animals, and those animals did not have any untoward um, outcomes. Um, there was no type of studies like that for um, the Pfizer vaccine, but the vaccines are very similar in their structure and how they respond. So it does not cause infertility. You can use it in pregnancy, and you can use it if you're breastfeeding. So that leads into another question about another vaccine that's about to come, which is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And so it's supposed to be available this spring. Um, why is, what's different about this vaccine than the, the two that are currently available? That's a good question. So this one is, uh, you know, working off of an adenovirus. So this is a carrier uh, molecule. So some of the good things, and again, one of the difficulties is that we don't have the whole story yet because we don't have the results of the phase three clinical trials. So hopefully more results of the phase three will come out. The efficacy of the vaccine is also uh, supposedly very uh, efficacious. They're reporting almost 90%. Uh, one of the good things with this vaccine is that it may be only one single injection. 
um, because it's a different mechanism than the mRNA. Another good thing about the vaccine is that um, because it's not an mRNA vaccine, it can be stored in a regular refrigerator. So as you can imagine, in terms of trying to get, uh, you know, that 100 million, that 100 first days of uh, President Biden's uh, term, if you have something that's more easily stored, it can be stored in doctor's offices, it can be stored in most healthcare facilities. Um, and also, if you're only vaccinating, uh, you need one injection, that's something that could potentially be rolled out. But unfortunately, um, you know, we've been sort of keeping an eye on out for the data. We don't have the phase three clinical trial data yet. Um, a few of the concerns about the, the vaccine also is we're not sure of the age distribution. So in terms of, I know we have people from, you know, different uh, community uh, um, boards here. So most of the, the two mRNA vaccines have been studied in people up to about 85 years old. Uh, the, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, we're not sure if there's data about people above the age of 65. So, you know, with these type of things, we also have to look at age. One of the other things that, that people become concerned about is how effective is it for somebody over someone over the age of 65? And again, we're not going to know these things because we don't have real world numbers yet. So unfortunately, you know, we're going to have to roll out vaccines, see what happens in the population. Um, but we do know that people, you know, of varying age groups will have different responses, just like anything else. Doctor, um, one of our uh, audience members wants to kind of come back to the infertility uh, question, which is, and, and this is the question, um, there is no evidence that that what you said is actually true, but that um, because it hasn't been studied on a large scale yet. So a majority of the those receiving the vaccine are women who've already been through menopause. So how do we really know that it doesn't have that effect? So when you think about it, there's been almost 100 million uh, patients around the world who've had COVID virus. So remember, whether we're giving you, um, you're developing antibodies naturally through an infection or you're developing it through this little encoding gene that codes for the uh, spike protein, the mechanism is basically the same. Because if you've had a natural COVID infection and you're in that, and we definitely see pregnant women catching COVID because pregnancy is a uh, increased risk for catching COVID virus. So those women, um, there's no information that any of these women over the past entire year has any infertility problems. So even though there hasn't been very large data sets, we have a natural group of patients now because you know with all those numbers, there have been women in childbearing age who have had COVID, recuperated from COVID, and now are pregnant, or there are people who had COVID during pregnancy who sort of convalesced and, you know, the lining of the, the uterus didn't, you know, sort of disengage and they didn't lose their babies. Now, there may be some cases that have not been reported, um, but again, when you think about, you know, almost 100 million people with this infection, whatever percentage of those have had, you know, pregnancy or, or got pregnant, um, that's actually a very large number of people. Thank you. Uh, next question is, can the vaccine be taken by autoimmune compromised persons, for example, someone with lupus? Yes, and actually, um, you know, those patients are actually at an increased risk of getting uh, medical morbidities, um, you know, from a viral infection. So yes, you can. Again, the only patients that we um, become more cautious with, not that you cannot get it, are those who have a true history of anaphylaxis. And when we get the vaccine, even for those of us who have not had any issues with vaccination, um, you get the vaccine, they watch you for 15 minutes. So 15 minutes seems like a very short amount of time and you're saying, well, you only watch me 15 minutes and then you let me go free in the world. But most of the patients who, the small number who have had some type of issue with it, the reaction is gonna be within the first 12 to 15 minutes. So the patients who had either a, a allergic reaction or some type of issue, that have been reported both by Pfizer and by Moderna, and again, it's very, very small numbers compared to those being vaccinated. Um, they happen within the first 12 minutes of receiving uh, the vaccine. So that leads to another question of, can a pregnant woman take the vaccine? Yes, and again, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology says that if you are uh, pregnant and you are considered uh, at risk for COVID-19, you can get the vaccination, as well as uh, women who are breastfeeding. Okay, so I have a, a mechanical question here. If uh, someone has an appointment for their second Moderna vaccine um, and they do it in 24 days instead of 28, is that okay? 
Yes. So again, you know, um, there's more and more information that if you get the vaccine uh, within six weeks, it's actually OK. Now, realistically speaking, even if beyond that six weeks, um, you you know, you still can get it. The problem is, is that now we look and see how effective it is. Um, but, you know, we should anticipate that, you know, don't miss your second dose because it's very important to get to that 95 percent number. Two doses are required. Should an antibody uh, go ahead? Sorry, nope, sorry. Should an antibody test be taken after an amount of time post vaccination after the second vaccination? You can, um, you know, and ideally, you know, what people should do is wait probably two to four weeks after they've gotten the second vaccine because it takes a couple of weeks for your body again to take that piece of information to let little building blocks in our bodies make the, the antibodies for you and now circulate them. So, um, you know, if, if pe and I know some people, you know, they have access to the ability to do that. So if they would like to do that, then it's something that's feasible for them. I would say wait at least two to four weeks. Next question is, will a person be able to request the specific vaccine they would like to receive? So as of now, we don't have any information uh, in terms of uh, requesting a specific vaccine. So unfortunately, there's a lot of uh, questions up in the air. And I think one of the things that's difficult is even the director, the new director of the CDC, they, they can't actually tell us how many doses of vaccine that we have. Um, you know, and again, it's sort of uh, when you think about the the scope of what we're dealing with and trying to roll out a vaccination for 330 million people. Um, and again, you know, one of the questions that I get is, well, how many people need to be vaccinated or have the infection for us to develop what's called herd immunity? So basically what herd immunity is, is that for certain infections, you need, you know, a certain number. So just say uh, for certain diseases, you need 80% of us to either have either the natural infection or vaccination. So that means four out of five people. So when you're walking around and you're out and about, um, if four out of five people in a little circle have immunity to something, that means hopefully nobody's going to pass the disease on. So with the COVID virus, again, because it's such a new thing, we don't know what that number is. So in the literature, I've seen something as low as, you know, 55%. Some people are saying 80%. Some people are saying 90 My suspicion is it's closer to that, you know, probably 80%. Now, when you think about it, um, there's been uh, 25 million people, you know, who've had a natural COVID infection. We're almost, you know, over 5 million, so that's 30 million, so that's about, you know, less than 10 percent. But um, the CDC director is very um, promising that, you know, we will get to that 100 million doses in 100 days. And the limitation of the vaccine is actually the ability to produce it. So I think, you know, um, healthcare, you know, despite all of the things that the challenges we've had, you know, right now, you know, for example, at St. John's, I mean, I'm always impressed by the amount of vaccines that we were able to do and for our staff and, you know, for people who um, are the frontline workers, um, it's, it's incredible. It was such a concerted effort on everybody's part. Um, and it was like, you know, after the first couple of days, it was like clockwork. And I think a lot of other healthcare organizations are gonna get to that point that, you know, we will help the community. We will be able to organize things. So what she anticipates the limitation is gonna be is actually the availability of the vaccination. Um, but I, I honestly think that, you know, we'll get to that number and, you know, hopefully uh, some form of normalcy, you know, toward the, toward the summertime. So there's two questions here that are sort of the same. Uh, can a person who has a compromised, compromised immune system receive the vaccine and they're talking specifically be about autoimmune hepatitis. And I think this is referencing an earlier question, but probably good idea to, to reiterate. Yeah, so yes, you, you can actually take it because remember, this is not this is not a live vaccine. So this is a little piece of genetic material. So you cannot catch COVID from the mRNA vaccines. So yes, even if you have an autoimmune problem and actually those patients, um, your doctors probably would want you to have it. So I'll give you an example. So we've had patients in the hospital who have liver transplant, kidney transplant, uh, cardiac transplant. Um, they have uh, actively treated oncologic issues. So every time we reach out to their uh, specialty providers, um, they said, you know what, it's a balance between risk and benefit. 
So the, the benefit um, of having the vaccine greatly outweighs whatever risk. And again, if we were dealing with a live um, vaccine, then you would actually be more concerned because we're actually now giving you uh, some of the live virus into your body. With the mRNA vaccines, it's only a small piece of genetic material that our body is going to use as a little recipe to make antibodies for you. So you can get it. Uh, question, how large are the J&J &J clinical trials? So in terms of the numbers, the numbers are, are not as big as the Pfizer and the BioNTech, but again, they haven't hit their phase three. So with the Pfizer and the BioNTech, they studied about more than 40,000 patients, and that's actually a pretty decent number. Um, the J&J, &J, the numbers, I, don't, I, I was trying to look them up over the weekend. I don't see because the phase three clinical data is actually not out yet. But what they anticipate is sometime by next month, they're going to be releasing it. And one of the nice things also um, with all these vaccine trials is that the information is actually publicized. So it's out there for you know, most people to access it and most people to actually look at it. Um, so once those are out, it's going to be you know, very exciting because, again, the prospect of having something um, that we only need one vaccine for um, will be a good thing because we'll be able to actually vaccinate more people. Uh, just as an aside, I know one of the other questions that uh, sort of arose um, previously is about um, uh, people in minorities uh, with the vaccine. So when you look at, uh, you know, traditionally vaccinations and people minorities, in general, people in, with minorities actually get under vaccinated and there's a whole list of reasons for that. So when you look at the yearly influenza vaccine, uh, people in minorities actually, you know, far less of them take the vaccine than the Caucasian population. In most of these studies uh, for the mRNA vaccine, about 27% of the patients were of minorities. Um, now, when you look at the population in the United States, about 40% or a little bit more are actually minority population. So there is some discrepancy in the numbers, but you know, 27% is, is not so bad um, in terms of that. Now there is, we see um, different groups and one of the groups that we see coming in uh, with the first COVID wave and unfortunately now with the second COVID wave are people of ethnic backgrounds. So people who are Hispanic, people who are African-American, people like my, 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 my family who is uh, Asian, a sub-Asian continent. Um, and there is a genetic component to these things, which we have not fully identified. Um, people who have metabolic syndrome, so the diabetics, so a lot of people who have ethnicities, we are prone to having metabolic syndrome, so the big three, hypertension, diabetes, and dyslipidemia. So that's a population that we're seeing a lot of different things. So um, although the studies are discrepant in terms of the percentage of the minorities uh, that were studied, there was about 27% of the patients who were studied who were of uh, different uh, ethnicities. Is there a number or count to the COVID antibody? And if yes, um, is the number quantity correlated to our immunity? That's a great question. So I, I could tell you that I I've been very interested in this myself personally um, because of uh, you know the nature of, of what we do in the hospital and actually coming in contact with COVID patients every day. So on day, so the way the scale works is yes, you can get a qualitative, meaning that a test can be run to show you that you have uh, two different types of antibodies. So whenever you have an acute phase of the antibody, there's an IgM, M as in Mary, and then there's an IgG, G as in George. And what happens is, is early on you get the IgM and then you get the IgG. With the COVID virus, a lot of different things have been happening and patients are either not developing antibodies or they're developing them at the same time, or there's a lag in between them. So a lot of variations have been happening. So you can get a blood test that will tell you, yes, you do have antibodies, but there's also a test that can say, well, you have this many. Now on the scale, anything that's greater than one uh, milligram per deciliter is a positive quantitative. Now in terms of is one better than one worse than 10 or is 10 better than one or you know should I have 15 on my number those things we still have to see and so what I did for myself is on day 20 after my Pfizer vaccine I actually went and got a quantitative um, assay on myself and so what I did is I sort of looked at the patients who had COVID and it sort of gave me in my mind you know am I close to where they are and I'm not close. Now, I don't know what to do with that number. I don't know what to do with the data, but 
but this is something moving forward that obviously we will build more and more information on. And it's also important because now, I mean, I, I'm, I'm well beyond two weeks past my second dose, um, but I will check it at some point to see what the number is now. And for me, because I'm at such a risk, what, I, what I'd like to do is, you know, moving forward, because we do know people at three months and four months are losing their antibodies. I would like to see for myself, um, you know, do I still have antibodies from the vaccination at that point as well? So that's a great question. Like I said, it's something that I'm very interested in myself, but we're not sure of the exact numbers and the scale yet of how they're going to sort of play out. More, more to come on that one. Dr. Rampersad, there's a, a couple of questions that are asking the best advice you have for teachers, professors. There's one in here about children or under 16 years of age, uh, generally all those who cannot get vaccinated immediately. Um, so since they cannot, is there a recommendation about vitamin intake during the winter season, specifically for women, but you know, um, can you overdose on vitamins? Is what, what should people be doing? Right. So that's another great question. So, you know, what we have basically in terms of who gets vaccinated, this is something that the CDC and the FDA has sort of rolled out as an action plan. And, you know, the people who are healthcare providers and the people who are in long term care facilities because they're most at risk, they're categorized as group 1A. Uh, the next group is group 1B. And so these are individuals who are above the age of 75. Um, and they're also frontliners. So they're police officers, firefighters, uh, UPS workers, our teachers, uh, professors, and transit people. So these are people who come into, you know, contact with a lot of individuals in the, in the day. So that's group 1B. In terms of the scheduling of when this is happening, there's a lot of factors that determine that. So unfortunately, I don't know. And I think as an institution, we're not sure about that either. Um, and then there's group 1C, and these are the individuals who are between the ages of 65 to 74 uh, with medical history, the age of 16 to 64. Now, the reason why 16 is the age is because they didn't study it in individuals less than the age of 16. So um, in terms of giving it to the pediatric population, I don't know if anybody really has information on, you know, when that group is actually going to be afforded to, to get the vaccination. Um, in terms of uh, things, so I, I can tell you there's a, I, there's a ton of information out there and, you know, it's hard to make sense of it because I, I can tell you during the, the COVID, uh, the first pandemic, um, I never felt more special in my life because I would show up to my office and there'd be scrubs, you know, from the OR nurses and then, you know, other doctors and nurses and our administrators and people at the hospital were sending me, um, you know, uh, vitamin D, vitamin C, zinc, uh, you know, immune therapy. So it was like a little pharmacy going on. And I have like a pill box that I take every day because, you know, everybody was so kind to try to, you know, keep me healthy during this thing. So um, basically anything you take that has anti-inflammatory properties would be something good. Um, so uh, there is a uh, some emerging data, people with vitamin D, D as in dog deficiencies, um, actually have an increased risk of this and people who are ethnic, people are minorities, even for myself, I have a very low vitamin D level. Um, so there is some correlation. It does not mean that if you have a low vitamin D that you're going to definitely catch COVID, but it, it is a risk. So the common things that people um, can take that may offer some um, you know, immune boost is vitamin D, vitamin C, because we know vitamin C has a lot of antioxidant, a lot of anti-inflammatory, um, zinc. So when you come into the hospital, we do give you zinc. Now, zinc is one of the uh, few elements that you can become toxic from it. So I would be careful with taking zinc uh, if you don't have a deficiency. So it's not one of those things that, you know, if uh, your zinc levels are normal or you have normal diet or you have normal kidney functioning that, you know, zinc can accumulate in your system. Um, Simple things uh, like turmeric, um, you know, some people believe in that. So when you look at data across the world, I mean, when you think about all of these medications and all these things that we use in, you know, in in developed countries, there is some naturally occurring substance somewhere else that somebody may be using that has the same property. Um, so anything that has anti-inflammatory effect will have some, you know, improvement on your system if you do catch COVID. And one of the things that's really unbelievable about the COVID infection is that the virus does cause damage to the body, but most of the trouble and the mischief that we see is actually our body having a dysregulated host immune response. And basically what that means is that our immune systems go into overdrive 
And this is what causes a lot of the illness in the patient. So it's almost like this sepsis process. So you know, when somebody comes in with an infection and they develop this sort of uh, syndrome called sepsis, uh, the COVID patients actually are developing something like this and it's all related to inflammation. Okay, um, so we're gonna do three more questions and then we have to call it a day. So the first one is, uh, will, is there a time frame uh, or are we going to know at some point how long we will be protected by the vaccine? Or is this going to be something that's going to have to um, be done every year? Is there a way yes. to know? So, yeah. Right, so right now there's no way to know other than us sort of studying the population. And so when we talk about efficacy and effectiveness, so efficacy is something they do in a controlled uh, trial. Effectiveness is something that we see once it's in the real world. So analyzing the data, seeing how many people have been vaccinated, tracking those patients like we talked about before, whether they still have you know, IgG and what the percentage of IgG they have. So no one really knows. And you know, one of the things that's, you know, when you think about it, if people who had a natural COVID infection, if they're losing their antibodies or in three to four months, some of them, um, can that happen with the vaccine? Yes, it can, because you know this is a host uh, response to a piece of genetic material. And the only way we know again is we're going to track it over time. And what most people think uh, when you go to the CDC and the FDA is that there will be a yearly COVID vaccine because we already know that there's multiple strains of uh, various COVID diseases out there. Um, there is some information that the vaccines we currently have uh, will offer some partial protection because it is a spike protein vaccine, but obviously it can't be a full protection. And again, those numbers are not going to be so clear until we study later on the population who've actually had these type of uh, vaccinations and what percentage of them ended up getting an infection and how long the antibodies are lasting for. Now, it's interesting because Moderna in some of their literature has said that they hope that their vaccine will um, you know, be effective, efficacious, I should say, for you know maybe 18 months to 24 months how they know that i'm not sure because we haven't had that much time with the vaccine you know in the population um but you know we, we hope uh you know the longer we can have it the better for everybody but those those are questions we won't answer until uh further down the road okay uh this is an interesting question it has been mentioned in the spring that persons with blood type a were more at risk for covid rather than those with blood type O, and I actually heard if it's O negative or O positive, I'm not really sure. Is that something you've heard? Yes, definitely. That's a great question. So, you know, one of the things that we've um, been a part of here at St. John's is uh, something called convalescent plasma. So basically what happens is that just say that a person had COVID virus and they were a type A blood type, um, we actually were part of the big Mayo Clinic study. And we, we were the, the hospital in the area probably who had the most patients enrolled in the Mayo Clinic uh, protocol. So one of the great things for me is that I was constantly getting emails from the Mayo Clinic in terms of the demographics of people. So we definitely saw people with type A and type B blood typing to be uh, much more common. People with type O, which is universal type, they were less common. Um, what that all means, we're still looking at it. Um, and in the hospital as well, it also is in terms of ethnicity. So, you know, for example, I'm a type B and, you know, a lot of people who are Southeast Asian, we have type B or type A. Um, so those populations are definitely uh, the ones that are more commonly seen to get COVID. One of the other things that I read that was interesting is that in terms of the infection itself, uh, we, we there is data out there to suggest that more men get it. And so when they were looking at this, um, they were looking at why, is it an X chromosome? Is it a Y chromosome? So since women have two, um, they were feeling that it may be something linked onto the X chromosome that offers some protection because if men get it, we only have one X chromosome. So there are different things. And you know, and th this COVID virus has been such a, a difficult process for everyone you know, for over the past year. But when you look at it from a, a science perspective and a medical perspective, it's something that is is extremely unique. It's it's creating uh, an incredible amount of research, um, and you know, and our hope is is that by looking to see how to deal with COVID, understanding COVID, fighting COVID, we're going to be able to get data to help with other conditions, to treat other conditions, to treat patients with other illnesses, you know, into the future. 
to see how to um, you know work together as a, as a community to uh, vaccinate more to you know public health more. So you know from a really uh, devastating type of condition, you know we're all hoping that there's going to be a lot of things in the future that hopefully when we look back, it, it sort of has uh, taught us. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of information about there. So the people with type O, um, you know, th these are like the, uh, the, the do-gooders, right? Because you can uh, give blood to anybody. And now, you know, you're the ones that seem to get less infection. But, you know, the data on that is still uh, in the process of being uh, weeded out. Doctor, unfortunately, we're going to take one last question and then we have to end. Um, and that question has to do with N NSAIDs. Um, so is ibuprofen versus Tylenol the right pain reliever that people should use if they get COVID or if they have the COVID vaccine and they have, you know, some side effects from that? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, there was a lot of buzz about NSAIDs early on in the first uh, COVID pandemic. So, you know, early on we were hearing data that people who were um, on a medication called an ACE inhibitor, which is one of the more common uh, antihypertensives that we should not be giving it. So uh, there was a lot of people who were stopping it. Um, there's no evidence for that. And actually the ACE inhibition actually sort of protects people and it's a great medication, you know, for your blood pressure, for your heart, for your kidneys. Um, NSAIDs as well was another medication that people were being told not to take. Um, so right now what we understand is it is okay to take NSAIDs um, unless you have certain conditions that will cause other problems. So for example, NSAIDs can cause uh, renal injury, your kidneys. Um, it can predispose you for GI bleeding. Um, so if you have you know, risk factors for other medical conditions, then the NSAIDs should not be your first go-to. Um, Tylenol is, is generally safer unless you have uh, liver disorders. So people, you know, like the person before who had autoimmune hepatitis or who has any type of cirrhosis, um, the Tylenol can actually cause, uh, you know, injuries with your liver. So in general, we tell people, you know, to take the Tylenol, um, but NSAIDs can be taken. Now, uh, some of the patients want to take these medications uh, around the time they get vaccinated. And this is a theoretical risk. And I don't know if anybody's actually proven this, but what happens when you take these type of uh, medications is they're anti-inflammatory agents, especially NSAIDs. So there is some theoretical risk that if I'm going to get my COVID vaccine and I don't want to experience discomfort in my arm or I don't want to have a fever, let me pre-medicate myself with an NSAID or with acetaminophen and maybe that'll make me better. So there is a theoretical risk that you can actually blunt your own immune response and not build as many antibodies as you should. So the general recommendation is, is that don't pre-medicate before your vaccine, but obviously if you're having a significant amount of discomfort or fever that will you know, cause a uh, medical morbidity, then it is actually okay to take those substances, but not as a routine thing. Okay, thank you. Um, Sorry, um, Denise had to um, was called away. So um, I'm Candice Cousins Hopkins. She mentioned um, I work with her um, on this um, on these webinars. But uh, Dr. Rampersad, thank you so much. That was the last question we were going to um, able to uh, ask today. But um, if you want to rewatch this um, webinar, you can do so on the. Uh, Facebook page, on St. John's Facebook page, and um, please feel free to send it to your friends and family as well. Um, again, thank you, Dr. Rampersad, for such an informative uh, uh, discussion. I think you really covered a lot of bases, um, and also to Mrs. Sally Pinto and Z Baird um, for being our partners. Uh, we're going to leave you with some information, um, contact information for our uh, virtual urgent care, which is now available, and also, also um, a physician referral number and a general questions number. So if you have any more questions, you can definitely send those to um, that email address or call um, the number that's listed. Thank you so much. I have, I have yeah. one last thing. Sorry to interrupt. Sure, so sure, one sure. last no, thing no. that uh, I always I always forget, but this is very important, <laughs> is that uh, hospitals are safe to come to. And I know I've uh, said that message before, but um, you know, one of the things that we've seen, which is uh, very disheartening, is that people who have uh, other medical conditions other than COVID um, um, sometimes are not getting the care that they need because they're afraid to come into the hospital and catch COVID. 
So unfortunately, we've seen, seen people with uh, cardiac conditions, with neurologic conditions, with stroke, with heart attack, with cancers, with uh, other things uh, that need surgery, simple, you know, gallbladder stuff. I mean, and they get quite ill with it and um, it, it's not good. So uh, it is safe to come to your healthcare institutions. Um, other things, uh, again, is the our virtual urgent care in our ER is uh, ready and able to uh, take your phone calls on, answer your questions. Um, one of the things, or there's a whole, we can sit here the whole day and talk about treatments for COVID, but if you are at risk and um, your symptoms are not so severe that you feel you need to be admitted to the hospital, uh, St. John's, we do have a uh, algorithm to give you what's called monoclonal antibodies. So we have both monoclonals here, the Regeneron and the Eli Lilly drug, um, which seems to be helping patients tremendously. So that's something you'd come in, you get triaged, you'd receive it at an emergency room, we would monitor you and you actually go home with it. Um, so please, uh, you know, we're, we're your community hospital, we're a resource here. Uh, please utilize us, utilize your doctors on the outside. Um, you know, and it is safe to, you know, go to your providers and um, and, and to seek health care when it's appropriate. We, we don't want to see anyone getting sicker than they need to be because, you know, they're fearful of uh, catching COVID right now. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that was a great um, ending. I, I think you uh, wrapped it up there. Please, um, yes, come in if you um, need medical care. Um, again, we appreciate you tuning in and um, we hope to see you next time. Enjoy the rest of your day.